So hi Eddie, thanks for uh, agreeing to uh, take part in this um, this BAFTA film session in Acton, and uh, we've got some questions here. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First question is, uh, regarding all of the research and physical preparation that you did for The Theory of Everything, um, with it not being filmed chronologically, uh, how did you find um, going between different stages of the disease, obviously movement and expression? What's interesting about film, I find, in, in relation to theatre, is there is no... Um there is no blueprint that no one tells you how to go about it or to approach it. And so it's only through learning from mistakes or speaking to other actors that I really uh, got a sense of it. With that film specifically, I knew that I had to do some serious prep. And the great thing was that James Marsh, our director, allowed us the time. I had about eight weeks. I worked with a dancer because um, I, 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 I needed someone to go through the physical side of things with me. And when you're, when you're making a film, the director is, you know, is doing locations, casting, you know, has got so much going on, working on the script, that actually to have a really intricate relationship with something like movement, you kind of have to go out on your own. Yeah. Um, and I asked if I could work with a, um, a, a movement specialist. And so I met this woman called Alexandra Reynolds, um, who'd worked on World War Z, all the um, zombies on that. She talked about the body in kind of sculptural terms. So she said, imagine mercury in your pelvis and imagine trying to keep that flat. And, try and so uh, we sort of did this workshop session and I, I'd never worked like that and mm -hmm. found it kind of riveting. Right. Um, we then spent about eight weeks going to a motor neuron disease clinic and meeting patients and doctors and really took that or the information that we were given there um, and then tried to relate it to Stephen's decline, looked at photos of Stephen, took photos of Stephen to the doctors who would then see what his decline may have been. And then we started prepping or trying to find that in, in, in my body. Yeah. And it was literally a sort of mathematical, because with motor neuron disease, the second something stops working, it never works again. Um, so there had to be an accuracy to, to, to that. And I sort of charted it all out. And I've never done that quite as... Um, as rigorously of, of specific body parts and when they stopped working and whether they had upper neuron or lower neuron. Um, and, and, and I tried to do all that work in advance so that when it actually came to filming, firstly you could jump in between the different um, mm -hmm. time frames, having hopefully done all that homework so when it came to working with Felicity, you just, you weren't even thinking about it and you were just able to respond to whatever she was she was giving, but within the confines of what the restrictions of the disease, if that makes sense. So the first day of filming of Theory of Everything, the morning was Stephen able-bodied, and then um, at lunchtime was, I was playing him on two walking sticks, and then in the afternoon in the, f in the first chair, and then later in the evening in the last chair, and, and, and it was totally um, terrifying, because, um, but at the same point, the great thing about it, I quite often find with filming, you know, it's actually quite good to jump in with a difficult scene. And following up from that, like, how was your prep for The Danish Girl? How you got into the, the mindset of your character and mm -hmm. how you were able to execute it so, so wonderfully? It was really interesting with The Danish Girl because I'd been cast in it or offered the film when we were making Les Miserables, which was about four years ago. What was interesting is it sits with you. You read a script and you have a... Um, that that story sits with you and you start doing sort of research not knowing whether the film's going to happen. Um, I was then lucky enough to work with Lana Wachowski and I spoke to her about Lily and Gerda's story and she was, I mean, she spoke so passionately about it and she really pointed me in the right direction as to where to start reading and educating myself on trans issues and trans stories. And the other great thing about our job is you get to meet amazing people and I got to meet trans women and their partners and trans men all around the world of different generations. So I started really with what trying to take or, or to hear con contemporary trans experience and then place that within the context of Lily's story um, at a time in which there were no predecessors, there was no language, there was no community and really try and work out what her emotional story may have been. And it was, it was complicated by the fact that our film was based on a fictionalised version of their story, so you're already quite far from the truth. 
Um, and yet there are these amazing paintings that Gerda did of Lily, so those were a great resource. So it was about trying to take um, really as much research from the period, meeting women living now, and then trying to find elements of that in yourself. In terms of how you've started and where you are now, like what are some of the like hard-hitting truths that you've learned about since being in the industry? I've been really lucky, um, and yet still, it, it does feel like it's really hard. It's we, we are in a trade in which so many people in the world want to do it. It's something that we, everyone who does it, is passionate about, and um, and as a consequence, there are there are there are complications and and the, the reality is a sort of it's very difficult to take charge of your life um, because you don't have control like you really don't I've seen it with um, you know elder actors who we think of as sort of icons and they are still on a list of actors and you know they so and so will get the part for that sort of uh, for that moment and then someone else who's down here will do a film that suddenly raises it and, and you sort of slip down and you're, you are on a list for your entire life and you're a commodity in some ways. Yeah. And if you have a moment of, of success, then that's great, but you also know that it's just a matter of time until it all sort of, you know, um, yeah. comes down. So there's that, but also you become great friends with actors because those people are going through the specifics of what you're going through and it's great to be able to share that with people, but there's also this sort of oddness that is you're going up against your best mate for jobs yeah. and, and, and frequently losing and then then sort of dealing with one sense of sort of competition. It's also amazing. You sort of, you sort of the amount of times in my life I've gone, damn it, bastard, <laughs> didn't get it, but at least someone I love got it. How do you keep that truth of, of, of the project that you want to do, especially now at, at a time where you can be able to hopefully have a, a, a wider choice. choice? You can be like, this one or that one or? Mm. The first thing is the, is the point of choice and kind of going back to what we were saying before about um, having no control is that the notion that you have choice as an actor is pretty rare. And even if, as I was saying with those elder, extraordinary, iconic actors, there's probably someone who's been offered it before that other actor in it, you know, and there's a, and, and so choice is an interesting one and choice is not something that I've really had okay. until recently, uh, it's changed, shifted slightly, but Theory of Everything, I was sent a script for, I was so moved by it. I was like, I'd love to meet for this. And you were made aware that there are five other people that have been offered it because you're not a financeable thingy or, or and, and you go in and you fight, basically. The answer to your question is, it, it's about an instinct and it comes from reading a script that first time through and and you feel something or you don't that word is something that you'll find thrown around a lot people go trust your instincts and you, you go yeah, yeah yeah how do I know what my instinct is like what <laughs> because the, I find that the second you have an instinct you question it how do you tell the difference between what you feel is is good in your acting what you feel in terms of like emotional reasoning mm -hmm. and what an audience uh, feel is good very interesting question and and the answer is you always disappoint yourself as an actor one's notion of it of of what a character is versus what ends up mm. being on screen is is never um it never makes you content mm. because you only see your flaws but with that there is um i did a play about mark rothko and and his assistant at that time wrote this this little thing which it was about being a pictorial artist but he said being an artist is not about talent and all that. It's about the aspiration for perfection with the acknowledgement that you'll never attain it. So like, it's kind of learning to enjoy the process of aspiring for a perfection that you won't ever get. And so with theatre, for example, people often go to me, how can you do it like for nine months? How can you do the same thing? And you go, because you never get one line right, let alone a whole play, right? You also you don't have enough distance. So when, when I watch a film, I always say to a director, I, I would love to see it, but I, I need to see it once in the morning by myself, then go away for lunch, then come back and watch it again, and then see you afterwards to sort of discuss it. Because the first time you see it, all you can see is mm. the glaring flaws mm. and, and in your work. And, and actually you have no objectivity and you can't see the bigger picture, yeah. um, which is always interesting with films because you prepare it in that vacuum you prepare your own character and you sort of forget that exactly you're sort of you're part of an ensemble and and um, 
And I really do find, as, mu as hideous as it is watching yourself, sometimes I find early on in a shoot, I'll then go, can I, can I just watch that back with you? And they go, and you go, oh God, okay, totally get it. Like, you know, let me go and s sort that out. Because again, what you feel you're doing versus what you're, yes. what's coming across is um, different. But I know a lot of actors say they don't watch playback, but I'm, I'm probably not one of those. It's about trying to find a balance between um, that fresh and like in the moment, uh, just being in the moment and the technical side totally. to, to where your body is shifting and how the camera and the cinematographer is and like the everything, yeah. the light, Every everything. Aspect. So you have to also, I'm learning to, to balance that and not to be afraid of that because for me, if I could, I'd just be like, just stick the camera on and I'll just do what I have to do. Totally. Mm -hmm. But you have to appreciate and, and respect that there's a technical aspect to it. Exactly what you said, like the mixture you know, the amazing thing about film in itself is it's this combination of kind of science and art in some ways. You've got these cameras and extraordinary technical facilities mm -hmm. and then you've got this uh, and, res and restrictions and l limitations as to where you can move, what you can do mm. versus you wanting to be completely free. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank yeah, you very much. So 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 I really, really enjoyed that. What's your top tip for learning lines? For me, there is none. Uh, normally it involves walking around a patch of grass uh, in a circle at about five in the morning for a long time. Even if you're under pressure, really sense the small signals actors will send to you about how they want to be directed. Each actor absolutely has to be handled in a different way in order to make the whole ensemble work.